So let's jump in. Someone tell me how to do the first one. Hey, what'd you try? Okay, so the first one was limit. That's x the first is one. X minus one cubed cosine one over x minus one. Because of the here, the cosine of that. Okay. So. Um, and then, so I like, thought about it in terms of like both, like, both parts separately. Um, the x minus one squared is going to zero. Okay. And then the cosine, or the the one over x, or the one over x minus one, is going to infinity as you go to one. Um, is that true? That's not true. So one over one over x minus one does not go to infinity. It's equal to one. The limit there doesn't exist. Remember, one over x minus one looks like that. So. And even if it went to infinity, what's cosine of infinity? It's ambiguous. Yeah, cosine of infinity is ambiguous. Cosine just keeps bouncing up and down. It doesn't really settle at a number. So. Yeah. This doesn't exist. The limit? Uh, it does exist. This limit does exist. How can we get to what the answer is, though? You remember what I introduced right before I gave you this limit? Yeah? Yeah, but you have to argue why is that. What did you say was the... Me? Yeah. I said you can do the square here. How? So you can sign two functions just on one side and the other side. Okay. And they both go to zero. So this one also goes to zero. Sure. What is the function you found? Oh, I just showed it does not exist, but... And you were saying it. Well, you can't really use square theorem to show something does not exist. I know. I never used square theorem before, but now I was thinking. So we know we need a boundary. So what do you think the bound would be? Can you tell me about boundaries of say sine x or cosine x? Do those have boundaries on either side? Can you tell me about sine and cosines? Wait, but not what, what you that? As if you're unsure, <laughs> do you not remember what sine of x looks like? Yeah. The maximum value it attains is 1, the minimum value is negative 1. The same thing for cosine. You think you can use that somehow? Now, obviously, getting at x equals 1 is a problem, but we're in a limit. We don't care about being at 1. So as long as x is not 1, specifically, what can we do? Yeah? All right. When you do x minus 1, so that's 1 over 0, so that would be 0. Cost of 0 should be 1, right? 1 over 0. If you just go arithmetically, that's how it should be. What should be 1 coming in? So, all right, cosine of 1 over x minus 1. So you substitute 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. Oh, you can substitute 1. Cosine is, isn't always 1. Right? Cosine is a chain. It's a variable function. Yeah. It does this. It's not always 1. Exactly. I'm saying the maximum point it hits is 1, and the minimum point it hits is minus 1. So I know an upper and lower bound for it. I have one of these things that kind of reminds you of the squeeze theorem when we had that when we had this thing, remember? Kind of reminds you of that. 
and we saw that if we take the limit of this, limit of that, limit of that, and both of these gave you the same number, then your limit of f is forced to be that number. Right? That's what the squeeze theorem says. Yeah? Um, yeah, we can use the constant function. We can say limit of negative 1 as x approaches 1 equals 0, and then limit of 1 as x approaches negative, as x approaches 1 is also 0, and this function lies between them, it also be 0. Yeah, but you have to be careful how you write that down. How would you express that? So basically using this, when we see a, a like a trick function, what we can say is, well, if x is not equal to 1, because obviously that's a problem here, I can tell you about the, the cosine function. Right? It has a boundary. Right? What is the most it can be? 1 is the most it can be. What is the least it can be? Negative 1 is going to be the least it can be. Right? Now, as long as I'm plugging in values for which it's defined, the cosine is going to give me an output between 1 and minus 1. So here's the thing. I can multiply through by this guy. Now what can you say? this is x approaches 1. That's 0. What's this is x approaches 1? It's also 0. Okay. So what can we conclude? The limit actually exists and it is 0. So there were three um, of the special strategies, I think there were three that I told you guys about. Um, so one was that one when you had the ratio of polynomials, you watch the highest power and talk about top baby, bottom heavy, etc. blah, blah, blah. Another one was the squeeze theorem. Now, oftentimes with trig functions, that will apply because we have nice bounds for the trig functions, at least for sine and cosine. <coughs> and so it's when you ever you see trig in a limit, if it's not one of the things that you can plug in right away, chances are you can take advantage of this somehow and try to apply, this, apply the squeeze theorem. Other things that work with trig were these special trig limits I told you about, the limit of as x goes to 0, sine x over x equals 1, etc., etc., etc. But these are two of the main ones that you'd especially try to apply if you see a trig function somewhere. Right? Trig functions are complicated to deal with because they keep bouncing up and down. So you can essentially take them out of play by using their boundaries, and sometimes the squeeze theorem can work in such a situation. So the squeeze theorem would apply here. And for pretty much B and C, the same strategy would apply. So I would just use uh, squeeze theorem for B and C as well. So let's actually just run through those, so you can see what it would look like to write it down. Again, we can't plug in 0 because of the 1 over x here. And again, 
Dealing with sine 1 over x is complicated because it keeps bouncing up and down. However, if x is not 0, which it doesn't have to be because we're taking the limit, we don't care about being 0 specifically, the sine will only give us values between minus 1 and 1, which means I can multiply both sides by x squared. I'll multiply all sides by x squared, and then take the limit of it. By the way, in the last one with the cube, you might have to worry about whether it's you're multiplying by a negative or a positive, because this one can actually take any value, and you might turn around the inequality sign, but you'll still get the same result anyway. Right, you'll still be between 0 and 0. But now, ultimately, we can get to something like this. And then you'd be able to say, well, limit of x squared as x goes to 0. Well, that's 0. And limit of this as x goes to 0 is 0, which means that's 0 by the squeeze term. This is actually a nice function, by the way. It's used for many other examples, and a lot of books, when they're talking about using the squeeze theorem, would use this example as well. Um, it's one of the guys that looks like this. Um, it's bounded up above by y equals x squared. So whenever the sine function gives you 1, the maximum it will be is at this level. And whenever the sine gives you minus 1, the minimum it will be is at that level, and pretty much in between, you're bouncing up and down in between. So your graph is going to look like this. Very nice graph. There are all sorts of examples we can use for this graph, but one of them is the squeeze term. Turns out at, z, at the origin itself, it's not defined. There's a hole there, but you get arbitrarily close to the origin, and you oscillate super fast. And then gets wider as you go out. That's a nice function. Sine x over x as x goes to infinity. Again, that's a squeeze term problem. How would you know? Well, you're specifically looking for it because in that strategy, step three was to look for these special situations. So if you see a trig function, you're probably going to think about squeeze theorem or the special trig limits. And so in the case of C, Squeeze theorem is probably what I would do. And again, the strategy is to just start off with the bound for a sign and then build up to the function that we want to talk about. And hopefully, at the end of the day, it's bound on both sides by something that goes to the same number when you apply the limit. So here, we know that sine x goes to 1 and minus 1. This means I can divide everywhere by x. I don't have to worry about dividing by 0 because we're going off to infinity, so my x is definitely not 0. It's going to be a very large positive number, ultimately. I can apply the limit across these. And what's the limit as x goes to infinity of 1 over x? Huh? Zero, right? Bottom heavy. That's one of the other special situations. So ratio of polynomials. So this means we'll have zero here. see this is notice that there's a trig function and a polynomial competing. The trig function, the most it can be is minus 1 and low, smallest can be is negative 1. But the polynomial, on the other hand, can increase to infinity. So you have a very small numerator over a very large denominator. 
and so it's it's bottom heavy clearly, and it should make sense to you that it will go to zero. So those were the first three examples. Squeeze theorem would take care of those. I used the squeeze theorem just before them, and. Do you remember what I introduced before the last three? I introduced the special trig limits, so what were those? Special trig limits. You see trigonometry, you're going to think, of course, you're going to try to plug in first, but other than that, you're going to think, can I apply the squeeze theorem? Can I apply one of these limits? You're always looking for these things. So if we look at example D, how do you think we'd do that? So 5x is in the end right here. Ideas? Yeah? Um, I think it would be 5 because sine x over x is 1 and then times 5. But I use a different method because I'm confused over here. Tell me because what you did. I just took the derivative of um, the top and the bottom and above that. Okay, uh, we don't know what a derivative is yet. Know. Not wrong, but we're not there yet. It's going to be a while before we can do a, a method like that. You had an idea? Um, when when the when the angle is really small with the sine function, mm -hmm. uh, sine of x equals x, right? The small angle sine of x and x are yeah. So it must be five x over x, which equals five. Like mm, no. Well, for one thing, I definitely don't want you to think, just in case anyone's thinking this and not saying. You are aware that this is not the same as this, right? Okay. So that that's not that's not true. You can't factor things outside the angle. Yeah. Um. So because x is way greater than sine function, sine of whatever, so it's kind of bottom heavy, so it will be zero. No, bottom heavy doesn't apply. It's not an infinite. Oh, limit. yeah, true. Um, we want to use this. The important thing is you have to apply the rules, like I said. Pretty much they have to be like a template and fit right over each other. You'll notice in the rule, the angle and the denominator are the same. So your goal should be try to figure out a way to make the angle and the denominator the same. How can we make that happen? Well, the angle and the denominator to have the same magnitude, but both are going to zero. Yeah? Multiply the whole thing by 5. Well, we can't multiply by 5. That's changing the value. 5 yeah. over 5? Multiply by 5 over 5. You do that little thing that math people do to cheat when they want something there that's not there. You multiply and divide by that thing. And now, by the rules of multiplication, you know that you can just shift things as long as they stay in the numerator or denominator. And now, this looks more like that. The angle and the denominator are the same magnitude. 
and you end up being able to factor out a 5 by multiplying and dividing by 5. Now you know that this will go to 1, and so the answer is 5 for that reason. Again, nice little algebra trick. E. Okay. How do you do this one? Is it six? Five or six. Ideas here. Say, say. Well, I was thinking first step multiply by 5x over, you know, by, yeah, 5x over 5x, so you have 10 5x over 5x times 10 over 6x. 5x over 5x. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have 5x over 5x. Right, because the, the idea is you want to switch these. Then what would you do? The ten five x over five x would be one, mm -hmm. and then you can multiply by six x over six x. Why didn't not just do that all at once? Because I'm doing a step by step. <laughs> So now you start shifting things. Now just remember from how to multiply fractions. You can shift the order of things as long as things in the top stay in the top and things in the bottom stay in the bottom. So I'm simply going to shift this guy under here while shifting the 6 on top of there. And then swap these guys out. So ultimately, I'll be left over with 5x over 6x times, I'm going to have the tangent 5x 5x times what that 6x or the tangent 6x. So I took the, the 5x in the denominator, moved it over here, to the 6 in the numerator, moved it over here, and just separated everyone. The people who are in the top are still in the top, I just switched their order. The people who are in the bottom are still in the bottom, I just switched the order. Multiplication is commutative, so that's fine. Now I have just the product of these guys. X will cancel. This would go to 1 by that rule. This would also go to 1 by the reciprocal of that rule, which I told you guys also apply. And so the answer is going to be? 5 over 6. 5 over 6 is the limit. So first step is to, you need to know the rules. You need to know them very well. So you guys first need to start there, knowing the rules in your head, not having to look in the book. The second thing is, you need algebra skills to be able to manipulate whatever you're working with to look like a rule unit. That's, that's it, that's calc one, that's the name of the game. Learn all the rules, use algebra to manipulate everything to follow the rules. There's no other skill you need. Once you're good at that, you're good at the algebraic manipulation, everything else is a cakewalk. You just really need to be able to see 
those manipulations. Know something that you're aiming for that would apply, use your algebra to get there. Okay, now this one's going to be interesting. <laughs> Anyone knows this one? It's like the hardest one. Someone's going, oh yeah, that one's easy. Well, maybe, I don't know. How do you apply that? Sine 2x to 1 minus cosine x. Sine 2x is what? Is it 1 minus cosine 2x? Or? No. You're thinking of sine squared x is 1 minus cosine squared x. Does anyone know the rule he's thinking about? Sine 2x, what is that? sine squared, and so you could also write this as 1 minus 2 sine squared. And in the event it's inconvenient for me to have the sine x, I can replace that with 1 minus cosine x. Negative sine distributes once you put in the parentheses, and you would get 2 cosine squared x minus 1. And these are called the double angle formulas. There are ones for trig, but you don't need to memorize the trig. There are ones for tangent, but even I don't remember the ones for tangent. You don't need them. <laughs> Just remember that tangent is sine over cosine. If I want to find tangent of 2x, I just take this divided by that, and I'm, I'm fine. I don't memorize a lot of things. I memorize what's necessary, and just know how to derive everything else. So once I memorize sine and cosine, I can figure out any of the double angles for the other two functions. Yeah? Um, can I guess part of you? Okay, so now knowing that, how would you do this? Okay. Um, so as x squared is the denominator for both of them, Separated into two, the sine x over x squared minus the other term, which is half sine 2x over x squared. Uh, where are you going with this? Now what would you do? So sine x over x squared is 1 over x, because sine x over x is 1, which will be sine 1 over x. Sure, but what's going to happen to the 1 over x as x goes to 0? I have a solution. Because, okay, so 1 over 2 sine 2x two over x squared will be negative 1 over x, then it will cancel 1 over x, and then it will be 0. How would this be negative 1 over x? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, after, yeah. So, we can multiply by 2 over x on numerator and on denominator. It will be simplified to 1 over x sine 2x over 2x. So that sine 2x will be cancelled by sine 2x equal 1. So you want to multiply this over that? Is that what you're no, 2 over x over 2 over x. So like a fraction in the numerator, 2 over x, divided by 2 over x. Yeah, but let's say you apply the rules, right? Because I think you want to think of it, I think you're thinking of it like this way. So you're saying this part is going to go to 1, and you're going to be left with 1 over x minus 1 over x? Is that your idea? Um, no. 
So the fraction over there is 2 over x, not 2x. Over 2x, 2 over x. So it's 2 over x over 2 over x. We're going to multiply by 2 over x divided, divided by, by 2, two over. over. Yeah, this is getting really complicated. No, this is it's way too hard. And, and, and at the end, the payoff I don't think works. Because your 1 over x is not defined. It's not, the limit doesn't exist. Here. But 1 over x minus 1 over x will be 0. You can't get to 1 over x minus 1 over x. How would you get to the 1 over x minus 1 over x? You apply the limit. But right? if it cancels out, you don't have to apply it. That's not how limits work. If you apply a limit, you can't apply the limit over here and not do it over here. You can't just apply a limit here and then just... I don't think you're getting what I'm trying to do. It's way too complicated. Sure. It's much easier. Okay. Use that. How would you use that? Yeah? Two side to two side to two side Right. Just literally take this, plug it in here. And what would you have left? Well, we have sine x times cosine x. So you would split the x into x times x and shift 1 over there. And so now this goes to 1 while that goes to 0. And this is 0. That's 1 times 0. Remember your trick formulas, half angle formulas, double angle formulas, cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, all that good stuff. All right, so the limit of that one is zero. Let's see. Try this one. Tell me what you think. You see that? What comes to mind? What do you think to do? What's your knee jerk reaction here? Yeah. After the top. Seems like a good knee jerk reaction to me. Okay. So you have see the x minus one here, and that you know that's a difference of squares. <laughs> What's the next step? Is an issue. How do we deal with that? Yeah. Do you separate it into two formulas? Sure. How? One has a negative Right. So we remember what absolute value x means. What does that mean? It could be x or minus x. What are the situations? When is it positive? 
Yeah. One x is greater than or equal to one. Uh, greater than or equal to zero. Yeah. So this one x is less than zero. At least, kind of an option where you put the equal sign. You could do this, but it doesn't really matter here. Okay, so that's a formula. And you just remember your formulas are templates, which means you can generalize that formula. This does imply that I can look at the absolute value of any function as two pieces as well. It's going to give me the original function whenever the original function is positive. It's going to give me the negative of the original function whenever the original function is negative. So when I see absolute value of x minus 1, what do I think of that? Well, when is that guy equal to 0? Well, it's equal to it at 1. So it's very important to realize that I can break this up. Now, how do you break this up? How do you break it? Um, you write one formula the way it is. Just take the absolute values that you put on the OK. So we have an x minus 1 over x plus 1 over x minus 1. Where does that apply? X can what? Um, is it when X is greater than or equal to one? Which means I can even think of this limit as a from the right. What about now the one obviously is going to be from the left? What is this form going to look like? template tell you? Um, X is less than one. Yeah, we, we, yes, but is this formula correct so far? Oh, no, you put a negative in front of it. Put a negative, because that's what the formula says. Okay, now what? Can you do each of those individually? this one going to be? Alright, this cancels. Comes x plus 1. So you have the limit of x plus 1. As x approaches 1, what do you get? 2. This one? What's this one become? Well, negative 2. It's same. Get cancel here, get a minus two. Conclusion does not exist. This is a, a function that looks like if you're at one, the right side would be at two, but it would look like x plus one. The left side starts out at minus 2, but then it looks like minus x plus 1. The moral of the story that I'm trying to teach you guys, things look complicated, they always connect to something very simple. Figure out the simple thing. You see an absolute value? Go back, what does that mean? You just think you're seeing this in your head, right? Now, it doesn't matter. What the x is, you can literally swap it out for anything, and this formula will maintain itself. And you use that to figure it out. It looks complicated, but that's it. It looks complicated. It really connects to something simple. Learn the simple things. Learn them very well that you can see them anywhere. You can manipulate them, manipulate the algebra to get to the solution that you need to get to. Thank you. Beyond that, I have to, for the sake of completeness, I just want to write down some rules. 
for you guys to know. I mean, technically, based on what I told you before, you can kind of get by without knowing this, but it's kind of something I'm supposed to tell you. The algebraic rules that limits follow. Um, as well as, it might come in handy later on if I want to prove something. So, suppose these limits exist. are finite, right, meaning if infinity is in the mix, you can't apply it. So suppose, also, let C be a constant, any number. Turns out limits obey certain algebraic rules that you can take advantage of at any given time. For example, let me get a silly one out of the way. The limit of a constant is just a constant. The y value is always at c, so that, that should be clear. Um, what's probably kept clear, but we can write down specifically, is if you want to take the limit of a constant times a function, you can actually factor the constant out and focus on the limit of the function. So this would look like cl. So from limits, you can factor out constants. They work very nice that way. Limits actually distribute across sums. So that's pretty nice. Not all things do. Remember, powers don't. But limits do. So if, if they have the limit of f of x plus or minus g of x, this is the same as taking the limit of the f plus or minus the limit so this would be L plus or minus the next. Interestingly enough, limits also distribute across products. So it's one of those rare things that distribute across both addition and subtraction, both addition and multiplication. So if I have f of x times g of x, we applied this in the trig limits here. We can literally just take the limit of each piece and multiply them together. That would be L times M. Limits can also pass through powers. So if I have the limit of f of x raised to a constant power, Let's assume the power is positive, so we don't worry about division by zero or anything like that. Um, I can actually take the limit of the inside and then raise that to the power. So in case you're worrying about the algebraic properties of limits, you want to know how can I simplify these? How can I apply these to mathematical situations? These are the rules. Limits are very nice. There are not many things that are this nice. Distributes across all sorts of things. It even distributes across division. Let me just write that down as well. Here. Limit of f over g is the same as the limit of f divided by the limit of g, as long as your limit of g is not zero. These six rules, there are laws, you can apply them at any time that it will make your life easier. So we'll stop there. We'll deal with we'll move on to continuity tomorrow and we have a quiz in the recitation section on computing limits. I'll just go over that. To practice problems for the next class, actually practice, try the problems. It doesn't benefit you as much to wait until we're here and do it together. See you guys tomorrow.